Let me welcome you to this, this workshop session. Uh, I'm very pleased to see so many people, particularly given the, the topic that we're going to be looking at and talking about, um, which is partnered relationships. Unfortunately, my partner, Andy Shaka, uh, can't be here. She injured her knee some time back, and um, she's not clear to fly. So she couldn't get over here. If it was, you know, somewhere else and we could have driven, that would have been a possibility. Um, so she wanted me to convey to you that, that she's very disappointed in not being able to make Stoicon, uh, but that she's found lessons from Stoicism very helpful in our relationship and also in her relationship with, with other people. And we're a couple who work together. Uh, that we, we live in a, a fairly small apartment. Uh, we're both entrepreneurs, among other things, and so we're on top of each other literally all the time. And so Stoicism has come in very helpful for, for both of us. She also finds it's, it, it's helpful for her in, in growing her business and in, in managing um, some chronic health problems as well. But we're not going to talk so much about that, but that could be something that, that plays a role in partnered relationships. So. When they started having a call for, for those of us who are involved with the Modern Stoicism organization to do workshops and said, well, what kind of workshop would you like to do? Andy and I thought, you know, something on those, those things that we deal with it might be helpful for other people. And so we, we decided, sure, go ahead. We decided to call us the Stoic Heart. Um, there's a perception quite often that Stoicism is about being unemotional, unattached, you'll see as you look at some of the, the quotes on that, that document that that's definitely not the case. Um, so there's a lot of questions that get raised. How many of you, I should ask, participate in any of the online forums like the Stoicism Facebook group? There's, there's several of them. There's like thousands of members. Um, Stoicism Reddit. Um, there's always questions about relationships coming up. You know, I, I've, I've just broken up with so-and-so, how do I handle that? I want to meet somebody who will you know, be compatible with me, I'm trying to change my life through stoicism, what should I do? There's an awful lot of that, so I, I thought that could be a good uh, topic to, to hit on. And when we're talking about partnered relationships, so this is fairly inclusive in, in scope. Um, it includes what we might call, depending on how you want to frame it, romantic or erotic relationships. You notice the very first quote that I have for you there has to do with erotic, you know, the erotic and, and stoicism. Um, but it, it could also include discussions about love or attraction or companionship. Um, it, it's good for those who have a relationship and want to do better with it. It's also, I think, useful for those who are seeking relationships, and we might also even talk about when it's good to end a relationship, when it's time to pull the proverbial band-aid off all at once. Um, so what I, what I was going to do with this, you have a, a sort of overview of the, the workshop itself. We're going to go through each of these topics. You notice that the, the first thing we're going to talk about has to do with desires and ideas and assumptions that we, we tend to share. And then I'll give you some for those who don't know about these, some classic Stoic perspectives on relationships, primarily on, on marriage. And we'll talk about some of the limitations of that and how we can adapt that to our uh, much you know, more vast set of modern problems and, and relationships that we have. And then I've got a number of um, Stoic practices laid out for you. That These are just uh, five that I think could be useful. So, you know, I'm good at uh, dealing with any sort of going off topic and coming back. If you have questions, we can certainly answer them at, at any point. I did reserve about 15 minutes at the end for doing more Q&A and discussion. So if we, if we have a lot of um, discussion in the middle, we'll just take that off of, of the end. But hopefully we'll get through all of this uh, material. So before we actually like jump into what, what the Stoics themselves thought, Let's talk about what it is that, that people 
and, and us in particular, <coughs> do in fact desire from relationships. And we can frame this in terms of desire and aversion. What is it that we, we want? What is it that you want in a relationship? What's the point of having one? There's multiple answers. So what are some of the things that people want? Yeah? Yeah, I mean, I, sometimes you have to struggle to get people to bring that up. That's one of the <laughs> Especially, you know, I, I teach uh, college students as well. And, and the freshmen, boy, it's very, very difficult to get them to admit that we have sexual desires uh, and that we get pleasure out of sex. But that, that's one of the main points in having uh, many types of, of relationships. Um, what else? Yeah? Companionship. That's probably the second biggest one. Um, and that often goes on long after sexual desires wane. Um, what else? For being honest. Yeah. Intimacy, which I suppose is covered by what you just said. Yeah, that can, that can bring those, those all together. Um, yeah, what else? Split the bills with. That's a really big one. What are, what are some of the biggest things that, that couples actually fight about? One is sex. Right? Finances are just as important. Um, what else do we want? Yeah. Honesty. Honesty. Yeah, so, so now we're starting to stray into the virtues, right? Uh, yeah. Children. Children, yeah, to produce children. The Stoics were, were very keen on, on that. Help and support in difficult situations. Yes. Uh, and somebody to lean on. Um, and notice that some of these things you can get in other places, right? Uh, you can have a friend who's, who's a support, that could be a companion. Um, there's nothing that says that you would have to actually have a relationship in order to have sex, right? We have uh, industries that cater to that sort of thing. What are we averse to? What don't we want in relationships? Disharmony. Disharmony, okay. I think harmony is a thread that runs through all those things that you mentioned. Yeah. Disharmony. Aggravation, you know, uh, hassles, right? What else don't we want? Dishonesty. Dishonesty, okay, yeah. Yeah. And someone not actually caring about your interests. Yeah, only about, about themselves, or, or even worse, if they care more about somebody else than they do about themselves or you. That's particularly galling to deal with, isn't it? You know? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, you shouldn't have a child, isn't it? Gonna, well, we'll come to that. Stuck, yeah. Stagnation. Being stuck. Yeah. Being that, that happens uh, quite often in, in as relationships go on and on. Um, so, what sort of people are we looking for? We could, we could put some of these qualities together. So I'm looking for somebody who fits these particular, you know, usually they talk about needs these days, but we really should call them desires. Right? Or things that we're averse to. Um, what do we expect of ourselves when we're thinking about relationships? What is a relationship supposed to do to us? There's, there's a lot of romantic stuff floating around in there in our culture. Think like about rom-coms. You know, a relationship is going to make me no longer be a slob who doesn't get much done and uh, dresses poorly or things like that. Or, yeah, well, I mean, we have these, these sometimes, and these are crazy ideas, quite frankly. You know, the notion that somehow being in a relationship is going to transform your life. What are, what are some things that we really do want about ourselves you know, with relationships? From a stoic perspective, you mean? Well, if you're a stoic, then yes. <laughs> I guess to be, to be uh, the most... Uh, lovable version of yourself. Oh, that's that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, I, you know, do you do you have a a right sort of to be loved, whoever you are? We all often talk this way, but you read ancient philosophers and they're like, well, you're not going to get loved unless you actually are lovable. And so, eh, if you've got a lot of traits that are not only unattractive but push people away, <laughs> don't be surprised when they they don't like you. You know, it's, it seems. Fairly commonsensical, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I think just touching on that as well, like the ability to grow over time with the challenges, the perceptions you break up with yourself, and you receive like a fresh perspective that 
kind of highlight something that you probably don't have a habit that you, you aren't aware of. Yeah. Which is maybe something you don't want it, it, when you first think of it, but actually... It can be challenging yeah, yeah. and uncomfortable. That's true. Uh, when I think back over not just my relationship with the Andy, but other previous relationships, that, that was something that I certainly enjoyed. Um, getting to see yourself through another's eyes when, when the view is perhaps not too bad, right? Yeah. So, combination of uh, early two, the best version of yourself. Yeah, that's what, we're, that's what we're striving towards. And so, Stoicism, we often think of it in terms of individual growth and perspective. But for the ancient Stoics, for most people, they thought of being in relationships as central to what it means to be yourself. There's a lot of talk about, you know, retreat to the inner citadel, and, and that's all true. But part of living in accordance with nature means partnering at some point or another uh, for most people. So I wanted to give you a range of stuff from classic Stoic perspectives on partnered relationships. And there's a, a number of things that, that could be said about that. I've got several pieces in Stoicism today that I wrote back uh, a while back. One for Valentine's Day uh, this last year that, that give a lot of, you know, where to look for these things. We, we know that the ancient Stoics actually wrote texts that we no longer have that discussed uh, love and friendship and erotic relationships and all of that sort of stuff. We know that Zeno uh, wrote a republic in which there was something like free love going on. Um, we're not quite sure what was going on because most of the references to it are fairly polemical. Um, but we do have some things that the, the Stoics, who we do have, uh, said about it. So I wanted to hit on a few of, of those. Um, one other thing before we look at these, if you, if you think about it in terms of goods and bads and then that whole range of indifference, much of what goes on in relationships really has to do with that range of preferred to uh, rejected indifference. It's not necessarily things that are good in themselves or bad in themselves. There's plenty of room for the virtues to come in. But um, the Stoics thought that understanding and, and managing these indifference properly was absolutely essential to the good life. This is how they differed from, say, the cynics. The cynics said, you know, you got good, virtue, you got bad, vice, everything in between, forget it. There was also another guy, Aristo, who was a student of Zeno, who broke off and said something quite similar. Good, bad, indifferent, indifferent doesn't matter at all. You can do whatever you like with it. The classic Stoics from Zeno all the way on said, no, that range of the indifference is extremely important. You just don't want to get too invested in that. Uh, you, you know, you can't actually be wise if you're not managing indifference well. You can't be just, in, in the stoic sense, without managing those well. So, another thing that's, that's really important that ties in with that is this notion of what's in accordance with nature. Um, that, I, I'd like to say too, there's some glosses on it that will say things like, well, that just means following reason or following the facts or something like that. It's much more complicated than that. Um, in accordance with nature is a great catchphrase, but it, when you read through the classic Stoic literature, it means a number of different things. And I give you, you know, some of the things that uh, are connected to that in, in these, these quotes, but there's like literally hundreds of passages uh, spent on, on explaining it. So how do we live in accordance with, with nature? Um, we have to think about our, our desires and our perceptions and priorities and how we, we realize these things. And for the classic Stoics, partnered relationships, in the terms of the paradigms that we'll talk about in just a minute, they were part of how we would live in accordance with nature. We can do it in many other ways too, right? You can preserve your proiresis, your ruling faculty or, or faculty of choice in accordance with nature when you go off to the baths, uh, which we don't generally do these, these days, but you can go to the public pool and think about all the hassles you're going to have. That's, that's one way to do it. But you can, you can do it also in the relationships that you have. 
So that's going to be central. And the Stoics, they tended to look at um, a couple different paradigms. You notice there's quotes here about the wise, right? The sage is often how it's translated. The wise person, the person who has cultivated the virtues, who's, who's living uh, the Stoic life most, most fully. And notice what um, Arius tells us about the wise person. The wise person acts erotically. This isn't a list of other things that the wise person does. They also act uh, sympotically, meaning they're, they're a good uh, companion at dinner parties. Uh, there's a whole list of, of things that they do. But he says, the erotic person is spoken of in two senses. In one sense, with regard to virtue as a type of worthwhile person. In the other, with regard to vice as a reproach, as in the case of a person who's mad, insane with erotic love. Bless you. Uh, valuable erotic love is for friendship. It produces friendship. Uh, the person worthy of erotic love, he says, is spoken of in the same way as the person worthy of friendship. The desire to have children, we see, is, is there as well. Cicero, speaking for Cato, who's, you know, who's a very orthodox Stoic, it's consistent with human nature for the wise person in living by nature to take a spouse and to wish to have children. Now notice this next line. Not even sexual passion, so long as it is pure, is considered to be incompatible with being wise. It's a very interesting thing to say. And again, Cicero is presenting the orthodox Stoic position at the time in saying that. Musonius Rufus, how many of you have read Musonius Rufus's lectures? <coughs> Not too many? You, you want to read them. They're very interesting. He was Epictetus's teacher. We don't have too much of what he had to say, but he was a very interesting figure, um, probably one of the most gender egalitarian of the Stoics. And he tells us about what a, a, a marriage ought to look like. And for the Stoics, they thought of this in terms of marriage. And we'll talk about how we can move, uh, not past that, but uh, include more in just a moment. So he said, the husband and wife should come together for the purpose of making a life in common and procreating children. So, so far it sounds like the, the old line about, you know, the purpose of marriage is making babies, you know, perpetuating the human race. You get that sometimes from uh, people today, right? So there's only one legitimate purpose. Um, by the way, the range of, of Christian thought on this, um, although sometimes you get that as, as the Christian line, there's always been a, a number of different ends for marriage recognized very early on by, by church fathers and then through the Middle Ages. Um, there's a great book called Monks on Marriage that's well worth reading by Jean Leclerc on this very topic. And those monks were drawing on Cicero and Seneca to, to think these things out. So Musonius says, um, Regar furthermore, regarding all things in common between them and nothing peculiar or private to one or, one or the other, not even their own bodies. And now notice the next thing. In marriage, there must be above all, above even making babies, perfect companionship and mutual love of husband and wife, both in health and sickness and under all conditions, since it was with desire for this as well as for having children that both entered onto marriage. So, Again, a very orthodox and consistent Stoic, showing us that the, the ancient Stoics thought that the point of coupling was not just, you know, making babies. You see, he actually says at one point, ah, if you want to do that, just find a prostitute. You know, it's easy enough to do. It's to have intimacy, or it's to have some sort of common life together. Um, there are other discussions that, that talk even, and I didn't have them in here, but that talk even about the need for carrying out financial decisions together. Um, some, some of these fragments that we have. Uh, Epictetus, um, I think, illustrates another common Stoic attitude. He was very, 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 I can't, can't give you enough varies, uh, against adultery, which was a common practice at that time, right? Uh, it's probably as common as, as it is today. And he talks about the person who commits adultery as essentially robbing himself, in this case a guy who is also talented in other ways and wanted to be regarded as a good person because of his talents, uh, robbing himself of the, the very person who he was, robbing himself of being the person of fidelity. 
of pistis in, in the Greek, um, robbing himself of being a person of justice. And he, and he essentially tells the guy, hey, your buddy, your damaged goods now. You know, nobody's going to trust you on anything. And then there's this great line in there that refers to this notion of what they called at the time, um, how does he put it, the, the translation is, uh, uh, yeah, are, are women not common by nature, community of women and, and children, um, which is what Zeno's Republic seemed to be saying. And he says, um, sure, yeah, a little pig is common to all the invited guests, but when the portions have been distributed, go if you think it's right, snatch up the portion of the person lying next to you and see how he likes it. You know, what about the theater? Isn't the theater common to all citizens? Yeah, but when you put your butt in that seat, nobody else gets to sit there. And so Epictetus is saying this about, you know, uh, sexual relations. Anybody could have sex with anybody, but once you've formed that connection, that's that. Nobody else gets to intrude, right? And if we want to think about how we would apply this in our own lives today, um, we have to expand the scope considerably, right? Uh, most people, I think, today don't, don't wait for marriage before having some sort of sexual relationship. Many people will never get married. Uh, marriage rates are, are declining. I know they are in the United States. And even in marriages that exist, the divorce rate is extremely high. So people talk about serial monogamy. Um, but what about the idea of a committed partnership? This is why we, we chose to talk about partner relations. I think many people are still looking for some sort of committed partnership that they would have, if not necessarily over the course of their entire life, certainly for uh, a long time. And so I think we have to think about that. Um, we also need to think about sexuality and gender. You know, The Stoics had traditional notions about uh, not just gender roles, but about um, homosexuality and LGBTQ things. Uh, I think there's no reason why we couldn't think of what the Stoics are saying today as applying to any sort of relationship um, with people who are attracted to each other uh, in, in whatever way, so long as nothing stands in the way of virtue. Right? Um, we also need to think about something that they didn't think about, which is getting into and seeking relationships. You know? How would a Stoic, for example, or would a Stoic, use Tinder or other <laughs> online dating apps. Now, they wouldn't, they wouldn't use it for like hooking up, but you know, people go on dates with Tinder. I, I know it's used for many other things as well, but um, I think that's something you'd have to consider. And there's other challenges that arise as well, and this is where I was hoping Andy would be here. Um, we, we have what you can call a, a blended marriage. Um, she is a stepmother, she prefers the term bonus mom, uh, to my two children. And there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, interactions with people who already have children from other marriages and bring them together and it makes things a bit more complicated, right? Um, they often say you, you don't just marry the person, you marry a family. Uh, in many cases that's quite true. Um, workplace relationships and other things Stoics didn't talk that much about because they didn't know the modern workplace. But that is where many, many people find uh, either their dating pool or the person that they feel themselves to be meant to be with. Um, and then there's the demands of work. You know, we, uh, you know, we Americans uh, work more hours probably than we should, and I know that happens quite a bit in Europe as well, depending on the country. So that places stresses on relationships and, and raises challenges. And then the other thing that I think the Stoics didn't talk that much about is how partners would be support in crises. I mean, we see them modeling it, like Seneca, right? Writing these letters of consolation. But if you have a long-term relationship, sooner or later somebody's gonna die. And you need to figure out how you're going to help that person deal with the death of people that they're, they're close to. I mean, just as a general point, everybody in this room, uh, either you're going to die before me or after me, you know, or at the same time. You know? <laughs> and there's no way around it, you know. So either, if we, if we know each other, either I'll mourn you or you'll mourn me. Or maybe we both go out together. Um, but that's inevitable. You cannot get away from it. So I think that's a big thing. Loss of a job. 
How do you help your partner deal with uh, in this essentially terrible economy that we live in now? Um, how do you help your partners deal with that sort of thing? Uh, the Stoics don't have that much to say directly about that, but I think we can adapt much of what they do have to say to help us with that. So this is a great opportunity for modern Stoicism. Um, let me see how we are in time. So that's, that's sort of enough about the, the, the Stoic <laughs> role. Let's talk about some of these practices and perspectives. So the first one I thought would be very useful and I know we've used it a lot, uh, is dealing with appearances. And you heard some discussion of that today. Appearances or impressions are usually how it's translated, fantasiae. They also mean imaginations. I was glad there was a talk that made that connection. Uh, the fantasia is the faculty of imagination. There are the things that impinge on us. There are these immediate, uh, you could say, possibilities for judgment or to suspend Ascent. They're more than that, though. We can recall them and bring them to mind ourselves. So appearances are something that's, that's extremely important. How far do they extend? Um, if we look at Epictetus, who is, you know, he, he's presenting this as the Stoic position. It's not just like external things that we're seeing. Every movie you watch is a system of appearances. Every book you read is a system of appearances. He uses the Iliad as an example. He says, what is the Iliad or what are these Greek tragedies other than vast systems of appearances? You know what else is a system of appearance for, for Epictetus? Reason itself. Your very fat, your, your rational faculty, the logike, uh, dunamé. Which is, by the way, the, the same thing as the ruling faculty, and considered in another way is the same thing as the pro racist your faculty of choice. These are all aspects of the same thing for Epictetus. So we can have a whole conversation about that. Um, they're all involving appearances. You never, ever get away from them. There is no inner citadel to retreat to where it would just be you and your judgments and appearances would be on the outside. Even those judgments are, to some degree, appearance dependent. So these are very important. And the idea in Stoicism is not to eliminate or just withdraw from appearances. It's to try to get them right. So what impact does this have on our relationships? A lot of what people call communication problems, from a Stoic perspective, are appearance problems. They're matters of us responding to what it is the other person is saying or what we think that what they're doing is saying to us because everything a person does can convey messages. And rather than following the advice of the Stoics, which is to test appearances, to you know, with, to say, wait a second, I'm not sure if this is what I'm perceiving it to be right now, we do what? We react. We infer. We make judgments about them, and then we, we act in a certain way. And then what happens, you know, if, if we do that on our own, it's, it's problematic enough, but when we're in a dual relationship with a partner, you can set up a feedback loop, right? And so, how many of you have had the experience of being in a fight with your partner, and you say something, and it's perfectly reasonable in your eyes for you to say this as a response to your partner to the unreasonable thing that they said and then they take what you said in the worst way and argue with you that's really you know, of course you probably do the same thing after they do it um, that's arguing about appearances and you can get very heated about that can't you there's almost infinite capacity to misinterpret what the other person is saying Especially if you choose to do so. You want to you know, be right or something like that. So this is, I think, the stoic techniques of withdrawing for a moment and saying, wait a second, is this really what's going on? And then bringing something to bear to test the appearances, that can be extraordinarily helpful in diffusing things. Um, so you might think about it as preventive maintenance that you need to do within um, your relationship. And the same thing goes for when things are great. You know, what, what's one of the common things that happens to people when they first start dating? Honeymoon phase. 
Yeah. Now, let's be. What do we mean by a honeymoon phase? Where, where you ignore each other's faults. faults. <laughs> yeah. Warning signs, red flags. Uh, sure. Yeah. Did, were you? Did you have something you were going to say? I just said yeah, you know, we, we overlook, so we have this appearance, and the appearance is, oh my God, this person is amazing. And we just can't stop talking about them, and our friends are like, shut up about so-and-so, quit posting things on Facebook about how happy you are. Um, and you are, you know, you, you are happy, and not in the sense of eudaimonia happiness, but you're happy, you're joyful. Um, but it could be based on all sorts of things that are completely wrong. And so we have to test those appearances as well. And this, this might be the point where people are like, well, screw it, then. I, I don't want to be a stoic. Um, it's, it's, take, it's taking all the fun out of things, right? We'll, we'll get to that in, in, in just a moment. Uh, and that, that would be a, a legitimate worry, I think. Um, what else did I have here? Yeah, we, we want to avoid uh, making inferences. And I think we should interpret the stoic insistence that we bring to bear some sort of um, criteria, another one way to translate kanon in Greek, some criteria, we should think about how do we fit these into a larger picture that makes sense. Um, how we construct a story in which both of us in, in the relationship have some space to be characters within the story. Um, that can be quite helpful. The, the second thing I think you're probably all familiar with, the dichotomy of control. right? What, some things are in our control, some things aren't. Remember their Enchiridion 1, what are the things in our control? Money? No. What's that? Did you say not? What's in our control? Judgment. 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 Yeah. Our perceptions. Perceptions are not in our control. We, we have them. Um, there might be a translation that, that's using, that's a little non-standard. Um, usually perceptions would be fantasiae, right? Um, choices, those are in our control. Uh, desires and aversions, Stoics say those are actually in our control. So what if I have a compulsion? Well, then it's not so in your control that you can't turn it off, but you can certainly work at it, chip away at it, and that's in your control. Um, opinions or judgments, right? Doxai. Um, what's not in your control? That's a big one. <laughs> that, that plays a huge role in relationships. What else? Their reactions. Others' reactions. Yeah. Your body. Uh, we could have a whole discussion. Uh, you know, I control whether I brush my teeth or not, or work out, you know, or whether I throw you know, crap into my body or eat healthy. Yes, that's true. But you can still get, walk out there and get hit by the bus. And uh, if it hits you hard enough, you're going to die. And that's there's nothing you can do about that, right? <laughs> Um, you can, you can be. You, try to, looking before you, cross over. you certainly can do that, and then you can get it, you can get it from from the other side. <laughs> I mean, what what else is not in our control? History. History. The way in which people took it from the relationship, the history of the bring Yeah. Or the narrative that they carry. Yeah, that's 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 very good. I mean, you don't even really control your own past history where you could have changed things back then. You're stuck with what you've got. You can reinterpret it. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, I can't not have grown up in Wisconsin. You know, that's, that's just the way it is. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of choices. Uh, you know, I can't choose the fact that I, I have two children right now. I mean, I'm very happy that I do. Um, so... The, um, the realm of what's in our control, that's often talked about as something inner, and then we have these externals, taecta in Greek, and those are framed as being indifferent. Um, and it, I think it's worth pausing for a moment just to talk about what it means from a stoic perspective for something to be indifferent. It doesn't mean that we're indifferent to it. Usually, one of the reasons why we need stoicism is precisely because of the fact that we are not indifferent to things that ought to be indifference to us, things that don't make a difference with respect to our moral goodness or badness, our happiness or our misery. 
we find that we actually do care about these things. You know, I, I uh, worry about money um, from a stoic perspective. That that's kind of irrational, but you can't change it unless you recognize where you actually are uh, in terms of what what is indifferent and. The Stoics thought that just because something is, strictly speaking, an indifferent, doesn't mean that we should say, oh, well, it doesn't matter then. You know, do whatever you want. No, they thought we should manage, or the word that they, it's usually translated, use, right? Chesis in Greek. We should use indifference prudently, or justly, or courageously. And if we don't do that, we're actually doing something bad. We, we lapse into vices that way. So think about the whole range of things that are involved with a typical date. Most of those are indifference. What you wear, right? Clothes are definitely an indifferent from the Stoic perspective. So does that mean that you should just like, you know, throw on whatever and head out to the date? No, you should, you should wear what you think is, is actually going to play up your, your good features. One of the examples of, of indifference, by the way, that Cicero has Cato talk about, good looks, right? That's a preferred indifferent. Good looks are something that you, you know, you don't have a hell of a lot of control over. More, more today, you know, you can get plastic surgery or, you know, things like that. But, um, you know, you can work with what you got, right? And the Stoics would say, if you're going on a date, you probably should work with what you got. Not to the point where you're obsessing about it, but it is something that, you know, the use of that indifferent is something in your control. How other people view you, that's a great one, right? Epictetus says that, um, and Seneca says this often times too, anytime that you desire somebody to respond in a certain way, you're making yourself a slave to that person. You are putting yourself into their power. You're, you're actually, Epictetus uses that very uh, phrase, you're, you're putting yourself, something that you actually do have control over, into the sphere of somebody else's control. Um, this is a big problem in, in relationships. And you might say, well, how can you manage this? Are you supposed to just not care what the other person thinks? Then, you know, how are you uh, connected with them? How is that any sort of intimacy? You can practice the same sort of thing as you do with everything else, like whether you're going to get a job or not. You know, are you going to go on a date? Is the date going to be a good date or a bad date? Well, you do the best that you can, but you don't control what that other person is like. Maybe they're a jerk. You know, maybe they're very demanding. Maybe your interests are not aligned enough for it to work. Um, we can say the same thing about long-term partnerships or marriages, um, particularly when people change over time. You don't control whether another person decides to change. Um, a lot of times couples work on each other, and that's often quite unsuccessful uh, because it stems from a desire to control the other person, to bring them within the sphere of your control. Um, and that's a counterproductive strategy. The best you can do is simply to communicate what you want to the other person and then hope, you know, from a stoic perspective, not strictly speaking hope, but I have no problem saying hope, hope that it's going to turn out that way, but be prepared for the fact that it's not going to. You know, um, and, and if Andy were here, she could give you all sorts of anecdotes about me and the things that she hoped I would do differently and some of the realizations she's had. You know, uh, things that we buy. I am a clumsy guy. Um, I don't take care of things very well and sooner or later one of these cords is going to break because I'm kind of rough with things like that. And at first it really, really bothered her, you know. Why? Because, you know, we're both Midwesterners, we both grew up uh, in, in households where we weren't ourselves poor, but poverty was always sort of at the door, and so you're frugal, you know, you take care of things. And I try my best to take care of things, but they still break, you know, and it's because of one dumb thing or another, and boy, did that tick her off, you know. Why, why is somebody who can, like, pay attention to all these things when it comes to writing an article, why can't you pay attention to not breaking a dish? Well, because that's, that's the best it's going to be for me. You know? <laughs> uh, sooner or later, I'm going to break a dish or, or a cup or a cord. So you, you just set aside a certain amount of money to pay for that sort of thing. That's the rational thing to do. You know? um, Andy will, will oftentimes 
buy foodstuffs that you know are going to go into a great meal, and then time runs out, and mm -hmm. we have food waste. You know, I used to let myself get really bent out of shape about that. We have to be very you know careful with this. Uh, it's it's bad to engage in food waste. There's hungry people in other places. There's going to be food waste. You know, so we have to learn to, to use the dichotomy of control in a very prudent way within relationships. Um, a third one, roles and duties, right? Again, let's use Epictetus. He says, in the Enchiridion, all of our duties, or another way of translating this, appropriate acts, the things that we ought to do, our obligations, are given to us by our roles that we have. So if I'm a teacher, there are certain things that I should do in relation to my students that maybe I don't have to do with the average person on the street, but because of that relationship, there are certain requirements. This is a big area of contention, isn't it? In relationships, we often think that other people owe us certain things because we're in a relationship with them. If you really want to make things bad, you know, imply that, you know, because you, you deigned to be in a relationship with them, which you didn't have to do, that they should do something for you. That's a great fight start, right? Uh, so, um, and why is it? Well, because people don't like feeling that way after hearing that sort of thing. It makes you feel like uh, you're not really that important. Um, we exist in a matrix of relationships, right? And then we add to them. Romantic relationships are ones that we choose to get into. Um, I mean, you could talk about arranged marriages, and those pose their own sorts of issues. But in general, who you date, who you uh, connect up with long term, that's up to you. Um, if you are in a relationship, uh, you know, you may feel like you don't have any, any say in it anymore, but it is still up to you. And so you, you've taken that on. And so we can ask, well, what is the role of a partner? We can ask at different points, too. What... You know, if you go out on a date with somebody, what do you guys consider to be reasonable expectations? For me, showing up on time. You know, or having a good reason why you didn't show up on time. Um, what else? Courtesy. That's very important, yeah. Um, yes. Mm. Oftentimes, you know, you see that negatively. Uh, when people don't do that, you know, that may be the end of the debate. Or the, uh, mutual respect. Yeah, that may be the end of the date. You know, so you're like, that's it. That, that's a line I don't like uh, crossed. Um, what else? How else should people dating treat each other? Should they should they act as if they are the most important people in the world? Only only they exist. This kind of very romantic image, I only see you, I only think about you. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? What do you think? To be honest. To be honest. Be right. What's that? I think it's to be real. I'm not that kind of those romantic delusions. Like, oh, I think it's a romantic delusion. Yeah. Well, I mean, what if you do feel that way then? <laughs> Should you uh, lay that out there, you know? When, when you come in the room, I don't see anybody else. Uh, if you really do feel that way, then you've got to work with that, right? But you probably shouldn't say that if that's not how you feel. <laughs> yeah, authenticity. Another notion that you know, ancient Stoics didn't have the vocabulary for it, but we do now. Um, one of the things that we learn about roles and relationships, and there's, by the way, a very good book out there um, by... Uh, Johnson, called the role, Eth the role Ethics of Epictetus. If you haven't read that, it's, it's accessible, it's worth, worth checking out. Um, one thing you could think about is, you know when he talks about grasping things by the right handle? Um, now, that in, in that context, the role is brother to brother. He says, your brother is a jerk to you, um, how do you take it? Do you pick it up by the handle of my brother is a complete you know, a-hole? and uh, I should retaliate against him or something like that. If you pick it up by that handle, he says, you're not going to be able to endure it. Right? 
But if you pick it up by the handle that, well, he is my brother, and the universe doesn't owe me a good brother, just a brother, and I choose what I'm going to do with that brother role, he says that is something that you can carry it by. Can we apply that to relationships, uh, dating, marriage, all, all those sorts of romantic relationships? I think the answer is yes. Um, there will be many cases where we have to apply that inevitably. If we spend enough time with a person, they are going to do things where if we tally up the, you know, the uh, benefits and deficits on e each side, we're going to take the wrong perspective. And what we have to do instead is say, well, this is my wife. And, um, you know, the universe doesn't owe me a, a wife who's perfect in every respect. As a matter of fact, this thing over here is quite galling. But I choose what I'm going to do in relation to her as a husband. If I, if I make my being, if I make my fulfilling my role dependent on her fulfilling her role, or if she does that with me, neither of us are going to do it for very long. And this is something that I think would, would fit into the Stoic notion of justice as well, because justice includes beneficence, doing good to other people. Um, it's not just about following the rules, it's, it's about benevolence. So that's, that's important. Um, there is a, a concern that I think comes up in that case. Well, what do you do about somebody who's abusive to you? Somebody who's manipulative, somebody who is disrespectful, for example, over and over and over again. And I think this is a, this is a real problem. The ancient Stoic texts, especially Epictetus, sometimes give you the impression that you could endure anything whatsoever. And that because you could, you should. You know, uh, you want to twist my leg? Well, then you'll break it. And, you know, you're not going to break me. That sort of thing... <laughs> that sort of thing is not really helpful for dealing with, uh, say, an abusive uh, spouse. Because they'll do that, and then they'll do more and more and more. So I think from a, here's where we would have to bring in other resources, right? We would have to think in terms of the virtues, particularly the virtues of prudence or wisdom, and the virtue of justice. Because you are somebody who deserves to have justice uh, towards as well, right? Other people owe you certain things. And it's not prudent to remain in an abusive relationship. I think from the perspective of the present, we have a better vocabulary for, for making sense of these things. There is one thing, though, I, I'll, I'll mention. Cicero, in On Duties, talks about how courage, when justice and temperance are lacking, quits being courage. And we could apply this directly to that situation. It's not courage to have somebody beat you up physically or emotionally or even financially over and over and over again. That's actually bad for you. It's not producing a, a, a better situation just because you can endure abuse. So I think that's one of the things we'd have to add to this roles idea. So people um, talk about courage to retake control and therefore make the difference. Yes. Power. Yes, because in reverse. Usually, that's a great point, because usually, it's not like you're, you're acting outside of a context, right? If, there, if abuse has taken place, there's already a context that has placed you in the one-down position. And then to say, I, I'm not going to um, allow this, I'm, I'm going to say go to a shelter or something like that, is uh, a scary step. And so that would require courage. And, you know, one of the other things the Stoics don't talk about much that I think I could have talked about more is sometimes we have to draw upon the virtues of others too. If I don't, if I don't have uh, enough courage myself, maybe I need to um, have my friends buoy me up a bit, you know, or somebody else who can give support. Ideally, that would be my romantic partner. But if my romantic partner is the problem, then, you know, and, and usually abusive relationships, one of the things you see is they isolate you, right? They cut you off from all your sources of support. Friends and family. Emotions. Another big thing. Stoicism um, is about having the right kinds of emotions. A good talk this morning, uh, you know, highlighting the fact that Stoicism is not about being emotionalist. Uh, the, there was a whole zest issue, right? Very interesting uh, results uh, that, that, that Tim found in his research. So for the Stoics, this is one of the things I really like about Stoicism. 
Um, they understand the cognitive structure of emotions. Emotions are never just feelings that we just have, and they're not pure stimulus response, either the way a lot of people would like to see it. Emotions involve judgments, and we can unpack and examine those judgments and figure out why we're feeling the way that we're feeling, what it is that's going on with ourselves. The Stoics also offer us a, you could say, interpretation of the emotions that helps distinguish problematic emotions and what's problematic about them from positive emotions. I don't entirely agree with them myself. Um, neither, for that matter, did Cicero, who is an eclectic. Um, I think maybe they, they go a little bit too far on some issues um, or some, some emotions in condemning them. But let me give you sort of the standard stoic take. So there are certain emotions that are by their very nature, excessive responses, they're contrary to reason. Um, they may, in fact, have some good local effects, but they're ultimately bad for you. So those would include things like anger, for example. Stoics have a zero tolerance policy on anger, which, by the way, I don't, I don't follow. Um, but that's one of the things that they think is, is, is always uniformly problematic. Um, some others that we could probably agree on, jealousy and envy, those are always going to be problematic within relationships. If you're envious of your spouse, it can lead to a lot of issues. Um, excessive uh, fear or anxiety cripples many relationships and actually prevents many relationships. Um, another one that the Stoics would consider negative is loneliness. Um, Epictetus actually has an entire chapter. On, it's translated as on solitude, but you could translate it as on loneliness. Um, and so, you know, we can look at each of these and talk about how in specific cases there are problematic responses, but I think what, what the, the real takeaway is, Stoicism offers us resources for figuring out what's going on, why it's going on, and how to move away from it. There are positive emotions, though, that the Stoics think we ought to be having. The eupatheia, right? The three big classes of these that the Stoics recognize are joy, charis, which, which uh, is a rational pleasure, a pleasure that, that is sort of aligned with our rational faculty fully functioning, rational fear or caution, eulabeia, and then rational desire or wish. Um, they also talk a lot about love, uh, both in the sense of um, you, you know, uh, friendship, but affection, and also erotic love we've seen too. Uh, those, those are positive within certain, uh, you might say, strictures, within certain uh, boundaries. And here's where I think some of you might, again, once again say, well, I don't want to be a stoic then. I want that feeling that I have when I'm with my partner, being like head over heels in love. And we should think, well, is that, you know, do we want that precisely because it's unreasonable and irrational. If we do, then then you can't. Then the stoic thing is not for you, right? But you could ask yourself: To what degree could that be reasonable? And that would have to do with how it changes your or fits in with your other priorities, wouldn't it? Um, or I know we're getting very short on time, so I want to jump right into the the next one: um, virtues and vices. Now, the, the thing about narrative, or your story, is very important in this. We often talk in terms of the four cardinal virtues, right? Wisdom, justice, temperance, courage. That's great. That's a great starting point. The Stoics distinguish sub-virtues under those. All of those things are very useful. And, and they help us, if we use them as criteria, to evaluate ourselves and our partners realistically in terms of what we're getting wrong, what we could be doing better. A good relationship is going to require some measure of, of those, or at least not having the vices that are opposed to them. But one of the things that I think is left out of ancient virtue ethics, that some you know, modern virtue ethicists have, have attended to, is precisely that dimension of story. The stories that we tell about ourselves and the backstory that we have, that is just as much of a virtue or a vice as is the habit of doing so. Um, virtues and vices are also consolidated by relationships. You know? 
if you, like Epictetus says, hey, you want to make progress, don't pick a bunch of dummies to hang around, you know? Um, this, may lead, this may lead at some points to saying, this romantic partner is not for me. If I want to progress, if I want to have a happy life, you know, somebody who's a, a drama queen or king, right, who constantly needs to stir things up, that will not be compatible with a stoic view on partnered relationships. That's just not going to work. And it's wishful thinking to, to you know, assume that, well, if, you, if, you just, if you're stoic enough, you could actually make that work. That's not going to work. You know? All the stuff about Socrates and, and uh, Xanthippe, um, those aren't really meant to tell us we should stay in essentially abusive relationships or unproductive relationships. They're just to say, well, Socrates could do that uh, because he was so virtuous. And we don't, we don't even know if that was really the case. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is that virtues really bear heavily on the realm of indifference. How we deal with the things that are not in our control, um, how we use them, you know, and this would include what other people think, including our, our romantic partner. That is very much within the scope of wisdom and justice and courage and self-control or temperance. So in order to be a good partner, we're going to have to cultivate the virtues. Can we expect our partner to do so? We don't have control over that. Right? You can't make your husband or wife become temperate or, or wise for that matter. You know, some, some of us are going to keep making the same dumb mistakes until we, st until we decide it's a priority for us to stop making those particular dumb mistakes. Um, so I think these could be helpful. The last thing that I wanted to say is actually not by a Stoic, but does have to do with, um, with virtue. And how many of you have read uh, Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet? Only a few? Uh, well worth reading. Very short work. Uh, Rainer Maria Rilke, uh, great uh, German language existentialist poet, writing to another guy who wants to be a poet about what it would require. Rilke talks about um, things in, in fairly stoic ways. He's ta he talks about solitude, Einsamkeit in German, which can also be translated as loneliness. And um, he talks about the need to cultivate this. It's sort of like the retreat to the inner citadel. Um, but it's not a complete detachment from the world. And what he says is that a lot of people get into relationships um, when they're not fully developed. And this is the case for almost all of us, at least with some relationships. We would have done better to wait until we actually had everything all figured out and then start dating or getting married. But instead we jump in at first and Rilke says, well, it's no wonder they make a mess of it. And then he contrasts this to somebody else, something else. He says, a real marriage would be uh, one where both people had developed themselves fully and had this dimension of solitude within themselves. And he talks about two solitudes protecting each other. That's his vision for the ideal relationship, which he appears to have enjoyed with his wife, Clara, um, at least in part, from what we can tell. And I think that would translate very well into a stoic conception of virtue and vice, as well as the role that we have to be protective of our, of our partners. Um, but we have, that means we have to allow them room in which they can cultivate themselves. So I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. Now that we have a bit of time for Q and A and discussion, um, and I'll, I'll stay, you know, longer. Yeah. Um, you said you disagreed with Epictetus on anger. So oh, I'm with the Stoics in general, yeah, and even with Cicero, which is rare for me. Um, yeah. So the Stoics they have a zero tolerance policy about anger. It's always bad. No productive uses. I'm more Aristotelian in that respect. I think that there are cases where anger can, in fact, be useful. But even Aristotle says you got to be super, super careful with it. Um, sometimes the, the virtuous disposition with respect to anger will, will be a, the person who is more forgiving. Um, but he does think that, that we need it for some things. And Seneca you know, goes after the Aristotelians uh, as his main opponents in, in on anger. There's another thing, too, I'll mention with Cicero. In um, Tusculan Disputations, Cicero kind of wavers back and forth. The Stoics said there is no good version of pain or sorrow. And I think the Stoics are probably wrong about that as well. Um, but it's got to be in relation to reason. Yeah. Well, I thought that the, the 
the idea about anger was that you could show anger, but you shouldn't feel it. So in other words, you're in control of the anger, and you, you use it as a tool. Not, the, not for the Stoics. Not lose the yeah. plot. Seneca says you could feign anger. Yeah. That's not the same thing as showing anger, which you would actually have, right? Um, he says you, it can be useful for the judge to feign anger because then the, the criminal, you know, oh, they're going to get punished, they better behave, right? Or we do this with children, he says, too. But, um, you know, the Stoics were, were on the, the extreme when it came to that. The Stoics and a few Christian thinkers as well in ancient times. The Epicureans, the Aristotelians, the Platonists, they were all more towards those. Some anger could, in fact, be useful, but you've got to be really careful with it. Yeah. Um, we talked a lot about romantic relationships, but I wonder if there are parallels with non-romantic relationships or friendships, acquaintances, people mm -hmm. you work with, uh, whether the, the Stoics is located in the age between uh, those kind of long-lasting romantic relationships and maybe shorter Hopefully, long-lasting, right? Because some some work relationships might be very long-lasting after you know, as you have a string of, of failed romantic relationships. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Stoics have a lot more to say about friendship than they do about romantic relationships. Um, yeah, they valued it. Um, they don't talk much about what we would call like modern workplace relationships, but there's no reason why we can't extend the sort of things that they're talking about into that, you know. So, the, same, the, same, the same sorts of things that they're talking about in romantic relationships? You know, I mean, the one thing is, so in, in a romantic relationship, you not only are going to spend a lot of time with that person, the way you might say with a business partner, but you're spending time with that person precisely because you, you on some level, want to be with them, whereas a business partner, you, you know, you both lock the office up at night and go, go home. So I think there is a difference there. And you might, you know, you could say, well, I, I'm going to, you know, build this new wonderful platform with this business partner who's so brilliant. That's kind of similar to, like, producing children, maybe. But it is and it isn't. You know, children are children. I mean, there you're bringing in actual people who are totally unpredictable, you know. And they, you, can't, you can't really determine how they turn out. Um, but you're, you're responsible for them. Um, so there, I, I want to hold out that there's something about romantic relationships that is unique. You know? Yeah? I'm just wondering how you balance um, the virtue of temperance and controlling passions with erotic. Ah, yeah. So on that one, I err on the side of excess um, myself. Personally, um, but so the the idea is you you'd have to think because you, you don't want to be you don't want to be undemonstrative and, and, and unpassionate. So temperance does bear on um, the pleasures of of uh, let's call them the pleasures of the bed, right? As well as drinking and eating and all these other things, laying around in in, in the sun. Um, part of what it means to be temperate means to you know remain within certain boundaries. So, you know, you could be very demonstrative with, with the person that you're in a relationship with, and uh, you could have a high libido, but also not look at other people, right? Uh, you, you direct your, your attention towards the one person because you, you want that to be a, an important part of your, your life together. Um, if you wind up with somebody who's less interested than yourself, then you got a real quandary, don't you? And then temperance might be saying, well, uh, it won't be as often uh, or as exuberant as, as I might like, but this is, this is going to be, I'll have to adjust myself to this and, 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 and not look for something elsewhere. That would be, that would be temperance, I think. But you know, this is the cool thing about romantic relationships is, you know, should be having sex, you know, ideally, if it's possible. So, yeah. Um, just as a clarification, you mentioned that the ancient Stoics had talked about the relationship between a person's story and virtue. Yeah. Can you pick up on what you're saying? Do you think? Oh, so when we think about virtues, um, virtues, we think of them as habits primarily. And 
they are habits. But, but a very important dimension is also narrative. Um, the stories that we, we tell about ourselves, um, that fits into the, the habits of set that is mm -hmm. virtue. Just one second. Um, yeah. um, as do the relationships that we have. And it's just something that didn't come up much in ancient virtue ethics, but I think plays an important role. So you can think about, you know, for example, trauma. Um, and what we make of, of trauma, people have bad childhoods, and uh, that affects how they, they view not just sexuality, but romantic relationships. Um, in order to, um, in order to, to move towards virtue, it's not like you would leave your past behind, but it might require some reinterpretation of what happened to one or the choices that one, one made. You know, part of being virtuous, too, is like realizing, wow, I was really unvirtuous back there, you know, and I'd better not be like that anymore. So that, that, that fits into it as well. Yeah? Do you think a stoic can or should see around? I, I don't think so. Uh, I think that the, the paradigm, the ancient paradigm of some sort of fidelity is important. Now, now could, it, could it be okay for, like let's say somebody says, I don't want a committed relationship, um, and I live in this environment where, where it's very easy to hook up with people. We have apps that make that easy. There's less social program attached to it. Um, should, I, should I enjoy that sort of thing? Um, I mean, you'd have to ask, well, why, why is that so central? You know, why is that a high priority for you? Um, it, it'd be sort of like saying, well, I want to have um, gourmet meals every day, you know? Why? Um, is it, does that fit in with the rest of the, the, the stoic lifestyle? And I think the answer is no. Yeah? But then what does Zeno say about that? We don't know what Zeno said about that. We don't have Zeno's text. All we know is that he was criticized for talking about um, uh, sort of community of, of women and children, sort of like along the lines of Plato's Republic, and the book called the Republic. And then we see Epictetus sort of taking that up and saying, well, sure, things are common until we actually do make decisions, and then you better not um, take somebody else's spouse. Right? Now, they're, they're reframing it solely in terms of like men being the ones to have agency in that case, but we can usually expand it to women. But in point of fact, we don't know what, what Zeno said. Um, most Stoic texts are lost to us, unfortunately. It'd be great if we found one. That'd be cool. <laughs> All right, well, thanks very much. For your